of space in sustainable development. This event is organized by Trends Research and Advisory as a part of a series of virtual events discussing strategic and scientific topics. This symposium will be directed by Mrs. Tehen Neguen. Participant lists include selected elite of professional experts specialized in the field of the space. Now allow me to ask Mrs. Hen to start running this, uh, this session and the activities of this symposium. Ms. Hen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Ahmed. Dear distinguished speakers, participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, mentors and mentees. My name is Tihye Nguyen, and it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of Trans Research and advise you to welcome you here today to the role of space in sustainable development. We're delighted to have you with us to participate and share in the July symposium event today. So thank you for your participation that many of you being here serves as a reminder to all of us how important our work is. Today's symposium will highlight how the space sector or different parts of the world contribute to the sustainable development goals. Trends research and advisory's mission is to commit to cutting edge research that helps decision makers better understand the challenges of the future by using academic research and effective partnerships to influence and contribute to the formulation of policies and decisions of governments and international organizations relating to all aspects of global and strategic issues. We are honored to welcome our distinguished, distinguished speakers today, Mr. Luc Saint-Pierre, Mr. Masayuki Goto, Mr. Eng Fatima Al-Shamsi, Dr. Peter Martinez, Professor Bernard Foink. Hello. <laughs> Um, Mrs. Svetlana Vachringna, Mr. Enk Amir Algafri. And uh, before I hand over to Mr. Luc Saint Pierre, who will be uh, doing the opening remarks as re representatives of Dr. Simonetta Pip Pipo today, I will give a brief overview of the symposium's objectives. Today, we will discuss the role of the space sector and technology advancement international cooperation and the future of space explorations, the space sector and building a sustainable knowledge-based economy and the future opportunities in space. I want to say once more on behalf of Trans Research, welcome to the symposium. Mr. Luc Saint pierre the podium is all yours. Thank you. Actually, it's my bedroom, but it's fine. <laughs> Distinguished colleagues, uh, in the name of the director of the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, Ms. Simonita Di Pipo, it's a great pleasure to join you virtually today as we gather to explore how space can accelerate the achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I'm sure most of you already are aware of how important Earth observation, geolocation, satellite communications are in the 21st century. Indeed, our research shows that nearly 40%, 40 of the targets behind the 17 SDGs are reliant on space technology. And this is only for Earth observation and geolocation. If we were to add satellite decommunication, uh, this percentage would rise uh, even higher. This year is also the start of the UN Decade of Action. Uh, only 10 years are left uh, towards the end of the SDGs. Uh, we need to do more for sustainable development and we need to do it faster. It's great to see that the world is uniting behind the science, uh, but now is the time to step up our efforts. If we unlock the full potential of space technology, the achievement of the global agendas will be accelerated. It's simple as that. Today, the Office for Outer Space Affairs take two steps uh, to making this acceleration a reality. Number one is access. Uh, a big risk for sustainable development, both in the, in the near and long term, is the widening digital divide between nations around the world. Uh, a collective global effort is required to ensure that space part of the digital revolution 
does not contribute to deepening inequalities. Indeed, <clears throat> while space technology advances uh, have helped generate a great wealth of data and information in a short period, the distribution and access are still uneven. While it creates opportunities for some, others struggle to access even its most basic benefits. The space sector has a well-established prevalence for open, open source data. There are also tremendous effort, efforts already in place to make this data accessible to countries around the world. It is, of course, one thing to make data accessible. It is quite another to make it actionable. The journey from a satellite to a minister's briefing notes can be very long. We, may, we need to make this process as bureaucratic and administratively efficient as ever, so that all policymakers have space-enabled, evidence-based information supporting their work. Number two is integration. We are witnessing profound changes across the full spectrum of space industries, businesses, and services, from improvements in the way we work, travel, or communicate, to revolutions in agriculture, healthcare, or urban management. While many of these space-enabled innovations are still at their early stage, their impact already propagates as diffuse with and amplify the existing ones. But we must move beyond just thinking, Earth, thinking about Earth observation and geo information services. We need the global space community, community to work more closely together at integrating the power of space technologies, both within the sector itself, but also with stakeholders outside the space field. This is fundamental if we want to see the catalytic change we need. Like with access, it is only when we have this level of integration between space technology will we begin to unlock the potential of what is already in our hands. The Office for Outer Space Affairs has a long history in facilitating multilateral and cross fertilizing initiatives between member states. That is why we have recently welcomed the opportunity to work more closely with partners in the UA on space sustainability issues. Less than a month ago, we opened a new collaboration with the UAE Space Agency to build on our shared commitment to ensuring space sustainability, both in the space environment itself and supporting sustainability here on Earth. This is a natural partnership as the UAE has placed sustainability at the heart of, this, of its national space program. With less than a week before to go, to go before the Emirates Mars mission, it's great to see these sentiments being put in practice. Hope will collect and share previous unknown data on the Martian atmosphere, information that will help us all better understand and protect our own atmosphere. This is a wonderful contribution to global sciences. Allow me to close by noting that the power, power of space to accelerate sustainable development does not reside in some hypothetical future world. It is already here today. Thank you very much. Oh, T, you are mute. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Luc. Thank, thank Pierre for this insightful uh, reflection on the role of space sector in achieving SDGs and how space technology is accelerating uh, global implementation of the SDG. Thank you so much for being here today on behalf of uh, Dr. Simonetta Di Pippo, the director of UNOSA. We will have questions later. Um, so I encourage the audience to uh, ask questions at the second half of the symposium. We now continue with the role of space sector in technological advancement with Mr. Masayuki Gocho. He is the co-founder of Space Kubis in Japan. I know it's very late over there. So the podium is all yours. Masayuki, do you want to yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you for introducing. Uh, can I share my presentation? It's next to the chat, share screen. Okay. You click on that button, there you are. Can you see it? Yes. Go full screen.
Okay. Can you see? My, yes. yes. Okay. So uh, thank you for introducing myself. Uh, I'm glad to have an opportunity to present here. I want to present about the, the role of space sector in technological advancement today. Now, first of all, I guess nobody knows about me, so I want to introduce myself first. My name is Masaki Goto. Uh, my career began at the JAXA Japanese Space Agency in two, 2002. I engaged in manned space development in wide field. And currently, I'm in charge of small satellite deployment called JSSOD. Uh, on the other hand, I established a startup company, Space Cubics, in 2018, uh, separated from JAXA. I joined uh, this uh, symposium as a person of Space Cubics. I had um, I had experienced many space projects ever. Uh, one example is this interval. This is a kind of drone in space to shoot video during crew activity uh, to support crew from ground operator. I established a company with computer engineers who developed a main computer of interval. We space cubics will provide a useful but low price space graded computer by merging a commercial technology and know how in JAXA. I would start presenting this topic when, when I got invitation to this symposium, uh, I considered how space sector was used. Uh, I think uh, that there are two patterns for the space sector's contribution to technological ad advancement. First, uh, people use uh, space environment to generate new technology or services. Uh, space is unique condition, such as no air, microgravity, uh, monitorable, uh, whole sky, and so on. People utilize the unique environment for their demands. Second is the spin off. Uh, space development generate unique technologies such as uh, life support. People utilize the technology itself and combat it, combat it to the ground in industry. For example, uh, when people want to see the earth or forecast weather, uh, they need earth view environment. In this case, space is only one of method to advance uh, the technology. Microgravity environment is used to analyze, analyze crystal structure of protein to develop a new drug. The structure, uh, the structure is figured out and the data feedback to drug design. Or a material that is hardly mixed can be mixed and uh, microgravity. So the new alloy can be created under microgravity situation. Or recently, uh, some companies uh, launch many satellite, uh, many satellites to connect internet anywhere on ground, such as an isolated area or developing countries. This contributes to reducing an info information gap all over the world. Opportunity to use space environment uh, increasing recently because rocket technology is advanced. The case like this will probably uh, continue to grow more and more in the future. Oh, and, uh, oh. Next, uh, space, space development has essential technologies because the space is unusual environment. Human cannot arrive in space. Uh, so a manned satellite or robot has to work a lot in space. The robot should be controlled from the earth the, and the, once the machine is failed, uh, we cannot fix it. Therefore, 
uh, we have to develop is considering how failure is avoided or recovered it uh, remotely. The some of unique technologies are possibly utilized for ground industry. Remote control uh, technology is very useful for many fields. It is difficult situation due to coronavirus nowadays, so demand for remote working technology will be increased. And the next uh, life support system uh, means controlling habitable environments such as uh, recycling water, generating air, toilet, to live human in space. This technology can be used for shelter or developing country that do not have enough resources. The robotics is also uh, essential for space more than ground. The technology will be able to feed back to ground industry. I will show the other case. Uh, this uh, L um, here, uh, that is uh, one of the startup company uh, in Japan, uh, will create man-made shooting stars for entertainment. And uh, Tenshijin, uh, this is uh, the other startup, uh, will forecast the best location to grow kiwi fruit by using big data from satellite. Uh, not only government, but also many startups try to use space to generate new technology or service. I think that space is very valuable field. Okay, next. And space, is, space industry is also growing constantly from economic point of view. Uh, however, uh, honestly speaking, the space field is still immature, uh, especially to business. Uh, grow, to grow up more, a uh, great idea to utilize space field is necessary. To increase number of, uh, of idea, uh, increasing player uh, on space field is important. Why the player is not increases uh, enormously? I think uh, there, are, uh, there are several reasons. First is high cost to develop space product. Second is the key technology is not mature. And the last is that it is difficult to build space products for newcomer. We space cubics want to solve these obstacles even just a little. We have computer technology and uh, many experiences. So we are going to provide useful space graded computer, uh, co uh, co computer with low price, high performance and uh, high reliability. I want to introduce our technology a little. Uh, usually uh, if we need high reliability for uh, space product, we use the uh, radiation hardened parts, but it is uh, expensive. And also uh, once the part is failed in space, the space product is dead because uh, the part cannot recover automatically. Just the failure rate is reduced and all outcome uh, plan to be acquired in, is also disappeared. On the other hand, uh, we focus all recovery function uh, because failure is definitely occurred. The function uh, monitors health and status of the space product. And when uh, it, when, uh, it is failed, fix the, the failed location automatically. And the triple modular redundancy system uh, named uh, TMR uh, detects the data error and uh, correct it immediately. As a result, the space product uh, works properly and downlink data is uh, always correct. This realized by only using uh, using the cheap uh, cheap path. 
and we use this FPGA. This device can build any, any function you want and uh, change it as many times like legal. Each user demands uh, each mission in space. So usually they custom commercial products by special order with high cost. Our computer, uh, computer with FPGA can respond to a customer's demand for their mission on orbit flexibly uh, without high cost. This technology achieves keep working and a precise judgment this will contribute to various fields on ground. Of course, uh, we can imagine that it is needed for industry related to human life, like uh, aut automatic driving or medical equipment. And uh, there are a lot of services to be continued working for our life. For example, uh, once the internet is stopped, uh, due to a crashing data center or communication base station, uh, many people is necessary to fix it. We hope our technology for space will help technological advancement, uh, not only in space, but also on ground. Our vision is that uh, we will provide useful computer and a satellite bus system fast. With combining ground industry, we aim to decrease uh, product, project costs to develop space product. Then increase, increase prayers and uh, enlarge consortium for creating big projects. Finally, we hope we can realize the era when anyone can go to space. Oh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Masayuku Goto, for sharing uh, this uh, opportunities in this field to generate new tech on your own example with space cubics. It's very inspiring. Thank you very much. I know it's late. So um, we now continue with Ms. Bianca Cefalo. Uh, she is a space system thermal product manager at Airbus Defense and Space in the United Kingdom, our rocket scientist. She's going to present uh, the role of telecommunication satellites on infrastructure optimization and digital divide. Bianca? Thank you, Ian. And um, it's first of all my honor to be here and to share uh, the stage with all of you. Um, so going basically back on, on the line on of what Luxembourg and also Masayuki have already anticipated. Um, the role of space technologies and especially of satellites communication, uh, as we see today, as exponentially boomed in these exact moments of our life. So if you think about everything that in any countries now is happening with the global pandemic, all the rescuers, all the telemedicine that is needed, and the daily basis communication that is now everything digital, education, businesses, everything is running throughout working from home scheme, which means if we didn't have internet, and if we didn't have GPS enough, if we didn't have enough bread broadband and TV broadcast, not only in the countries that are developed enough, but also in all the other ones that could really reach TV or education, if only based on cabling, we wouldn't have had the life that we have today. So uh, one of the main thing that I'm asked, why do we, implement, why do we invest into space? And then the main question is, we wouldn't have anything, not even our smartphones, if we didn't have space technologies and satellite communications. So at the very moment, to give you a couple of numbers, we have approximately estimated 2,000 telecommunications spacecraft orbiting around the Earth, having various pilots and various, uh, mm, uh, let's say, uh, fun functioning services. We obviously have uh, geolocated satellites, so the ones that are actually giving the 
a major system that is based on the internet, TV, broadband. And if you think about these kind of services like TV, broadband and internet, they only started after the Second World War to become something that was moving more towards commercial use rather than military. Because at the very beginning, satellite communication was something that was just based on elitist government and military missions. But now, moving towards a way more digitalized way of living and running businesses, the end users, the end customers is every one of us. So there is a way more movement toward the commercial, which means there has to be a way bigger collective effort throughout the whole countries, but, whole, but also throughout the old technology know-how coming from everywhere in the world. Because the more the end users are needing the internet, the TV broadband, the GPS, the weather forecast, disaster uh, responders, the more the technology needs to be up and running. Which means if before we were only based on the biggest telecommunication spacecraft on geolocation, now we are moving more towards mega constellations, CubeSats, even more, more smaller sets that can actually give the services that before were only possible with the bigger technology. And the more we are moving towards a miniaturization, like think about our laptops and our smartphones, they weren't as small as they were when they were invented. We are moving towards the same path with space technology. And the more we are moving towards more commercial end users, the more we need to come up with faster, more flexible, cheaper and lighter solutions, which obviously need shorter terms of qualification. Because if you think about a qualification from a testing point of view, let's say, of any payloads and any um, subsystems that goes into space, the qualification uh, phase is possibly the longest one that has the need of simulating any kind of conditions that we will meet in the space. As Masayuki has anticipated, the space environment is extremely harsh and is something that needs to be simulated very, very well so that we can prevent any kind of damage or risk to the mission once it's sent into space. If you think about telecommunication spacecraft, a mission is long 15 years and there is no way that someone can go up there and fix what's gone wrong. So the qualification phase is very, very long. And if we can access to technologies that, for instance, are ground-based and they have been already qualified and they have a level of qualification that could be possibly transferred to the space technology, this would even shrink more what the, the, the way of launching something in the space. Shrinking also the technology is extremely important. Um, and to give you also an example of how important it is for the infrastructures, thinking about, let's say, remote working. It's something that has a ma massive impact on the commuting time. So if you think about commuters and if you think about pollution on, on a daily basis, working from home or working remotely doesn't really mean billions of people will use their cars, millions of people will use the trains, millions of people will use any other, even aircrafts. We have now realized that to sign big contracts and to build partnership as this one that is happening right now, we don't need to really be there on the, on the geographical position. Everything, building relationship, it's something that uh, virtually is something that is becoming more and more ingrained into our daily life. And this has a major impact on all the infrastructure and businesses and energy supply that we needed decades ago when this wasn't possible. Another one is water monitoring in developing countries. We've tackled last Saturday with a webinar uh, the importance of how water management and data satellites has a major effect, especially in Africa and developing countries where this needs to be monitored and tracked and data access needs to be post-processed in those countries. This is another one. Another one is for disaster and emergency responders. Um, if you think about the Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, 95% of the cabling and ground infrastructure were destroyed. If there wasn't a telecommunication spacecraft, the responders wouldn't have had the possibility to track down and go on the place and actually help the people that needed the most. So 
there is an evolving path in the space technologies. And it is true, it's still very difficult. And there are many, many issues that need to be tackled. But a collective effort, uh, irrespective of what it is, the service that we are doing and the place where we are will definitely help us all, first of all, tackling problems that we didn't even know existed, because problems that we can have in Europe or in the States may be very, very different from the services that are needed in Africa, in India, in the Emirates or any other place in the world. So accessing to the knowledge of other people in other places that have tackled these problems help us also evolving not only from an ethical and sustainable point of view, but also from a technical and political mindset as well. And also the collective effort in the moment we think we are all joined together for the greater mission is making us move much faster than just having conflicting views on what should be done. So uh, to wrap this up is um, I, I love to say that um, any time that we think that space is really not our business, it is actually our business because our life on Earth depends on the security and sustainability of space and the outer space as a whole. Especially when we think also about disaster coming from asteroids. There was the International Day of Asteroids on the 30th of June. And again, spacecraft and the whole fleet of space technology is extremely necessary to secure our evolution on Earth, but also on other planets. And at the same time, collective efforts and joint ventures and open responsibilities and conversations are truly helping everyone to evolve, not only from a personal point of view and political point of view, but also a technological way and the way also we would see humanity on other planets and possibly also going beyond what it is the well-known solar systems that we are in now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bianca, for highlighting the role of telecommunications satellites on infrastructure. So meanwhile, we have uh, technology questions uh, coming in. Keep, keep asking a lot of questions and hang in. We're gonna read the questions at the end of the symposium. So it's an honor and privilege to now introduce you to Mr. Eng Ame al Gafri. He's the Senior Director of Space Engineering Department of the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center of the UAE. Welcome to the podium. Uh, hello everyone. And uh... Thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Moderator, for introducing me. Uh, my name is Amar Al Ghafri. I'm uh, part of uh, Mohammed Bin Rashid Space Center, and uh, in line with the, uh, I'm not sure if the right screen is shared. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, and in line with the uh, topic of this uh, uh, symposium, uh, I mean, from MBRC side, uh, I'll give it just a very brief about uh, the Mohammed Bin Rashid Space Center. And then we'll dive in, into this uh, presentation. Uh, basically, we are a government entity uh, based in Dubai, UAE. Uh, we were established in uh, 2006. And uh, since then, we have been uh, working in uh, different space uh, programs and projects. Uh, and the, the key goal was to uh, establish the, the space sector here uh, in the UAE. Uh, of course, the challenge was space is expensive. Space is uh, considered uh, as a luxury at some point or uh, could be a potential threat to uh, neighbors or to other countries uh, as a, a military weapon or something. Uh, however, uh, here in the OEE, we looked at space as the key uh, pillar to build a knowledge-based economy. And this is why the focus was on, uh, on the engineers and the scientists who will be joining uh, this sector and on the programs that are focused on science and technology and serving humanity. So we were established in 2006 and we were, uh, since then we have uh, developed uh, several uh, Earth observation uh, satellites, uh, DubaiSat-1, DubaiSat-2, KhalifaSat, and they are all now in space uh, and uh, serving uh, the need of Earth observation uh, projects and uh, solutions in the UAE and uh, globally. Uh, we are involved in several uh, UN initiatives uh, related to uh, 
the sustainability of uh, space and uh, SDGs, as well as uh, several uh, humanitarian, uh, I would say, uh, institutions or uh, uh, organizations uh, like the uh, and then the uh, different disaster uh, management and recovery uh, organizations. Uh, on, the, on, on the other side also, the role of Mohammed Barra Space Center along with the different entities that were also established in the UAE was to uh, promote space in general. And uh, that was done through different programs. One was the development of uh, satellites locally here in the UAE. And uh, the second one was the Hope Pro, which is the main topic of uh, today's uh, session uh, from MBRC side. And the third was the astronaut program, where we have actually uh, successfully uh, sent the first UAE uh, astronaut and the first Arab to the ISS uh, last year. And this will be a sustainable program where we will have uh, UAE nationals, uh, whether as astronauts or as scientists studying, studying uh, the humanity uh, or the human life in space. And the fourth one, which is the Mars 2117, another uh, very strategic uh, initiative, which we are in the UAE here. We hope uh, through collaboration and work with everybody in the world uh, and a strong push towards uh, research and development to establish the first city on Mars, uh, on Mars in uh, 100 years uh, from now. I'm sure uh, it's an exciting uh, era here in the UAE and maybe we will not see that city on Mars, but definitely uh, we are doing something that will help us uh, reach there, our grandchildren and uh, grand grandchildren. So I'll start with the main topic, which is uh, the main topic even in the UAE now, the next uh, major milestone here, not as a as space sector, but as a country itself. Uh, what we, we are trying to do with the Mars uh, mission, which we call Hope Pro, is to put the first uh, step towards very strong uh, science and research uh, society in the UAE and in the region. And uh, the name itself is, uh, is given by uh, His Highness Sheikh uh, Mohammed Barashid Al Maktoum, the Prime Minister of the UAE. And uh, the, the idea was this probe represents the hope for millions of young Arabs looking for a better future uh, here uh, in our region. We, are, I mean, we all hear in the news all the conflicts and uh, unfortunate events that are happening in this region. But uh, in the UAE, through the space program and specifically through, through the HOPE probe, we want to prove that uh, there is a future and there is achievement and there is life. And that could be done with hope and with strong leadership and belief from all the young uh, Arab uh, here uh, in this region and around the world eventually. And uh, in general, this uh, mission was uh, announced by His Highness uh, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed, the president of the UAE and the prime minister uh, and ruler of Dubai, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum in uh, 2014. And uh, the goal was to have the first interplanetary mission uh, exploring uh, uh, space uh, taken by an Arab nation. And uh, with uh, this mission uh, being launched, uh, hopefully uh, uh, in the coming days, next week, actually, stay tuned uh, for that event. It will be next uh, early Wednesday here in the UAE. Uh, the mission will go from uh, uh, Japanese, uh, through on a Japanese uh, launch vehicle, H2A, uh, from Tanigashima Space Center. And uh, it will take around a few months so that it will reach uh, the uh, Mars uh, orbit insertion, or we will actually do the Mars orbit insertion in next year, 2021, which coincides with the 50th anniversary, the golden uh, jubilee of the UAE. So a country only 50 years uh, since its establishment can, and uh, with the support with everybody uh, in the world, and. Uh, uh, high dedication or, uh, and uh, strong effort from the people here in the UAE would reach Mars and will put its own uh, uh, step and uh, point on the development and the science and the uh, knowledge uh, being developed uh, for humanity. Uh, of course, one of uh, today's topic also is international co cooperation and 
with any space project. I have been working in all of the projects here uh, at MBRC. I couldn't see any project uh, being successful without uh, international cooperation. And the Hope Probe is a great example of that as we are actually working with the, uh, so the, the actual uh, owner of this project is UAE Space Agency and MBRC acts as uh, the developer and uh, the executioner of uh, this project along with the, uh, also the operation of this uh, mission. Uh, however, we have to work with uh, people with experience. We have to work with people with uh, uh, knowledge and interest and also scientists. And this is why we have uh, joined effort with University of Colorado and uh, Arizona State University and the University of California, Berkeley, all in the US to work on the project. Along with what we have mentioned, where the launch will be done uh, from the uh, Tanikashima Space Center in Japan, also with that, several uh, and different uh, components of this mission have uh, in collaboration with different uh, countries around the world. And the final product, which would be the science of this, uh, and the, the science uh, that will be generated by this mission definitely will be shared with hundreds of uh, scientific and research institutions around the world. So why Mars? I think uh, all, all of the people here in this room would not need this answer, but just to stress on it. I believe all of you are uh, understanding this, but just to stress on it, uh, everybody uh, in the science community and the research believes that Mars is the closest habitat, habitable uh, planet with a proximity to Earth because its soils has uh, water, it's uh, tolerable, it has a tolerable uh, climate. Not so much tolerable, but uh, I mean, uh, relatively uh, tolerable. Uh, it has enough sunlight to power uh, solar panels. Uh, the gravity here uh, is very similar to the one uh, on Mars in terms of, uh, and that's just because of the relative mass of uh, Mars to, uh, to Earth. And that will make a human body uh, easily adapt uh, to its uh, gravity. And then uh, the seasons and the lighting uh, there on Mars is quite similar to one uh, on Earth. So this is why we want to understand Mars and we want to know more about Mars. Uh, specifically for our mission, the Emirates Mars mission, uh, it's uh, to train and prepare UAE scientists to do scientific, uh, science work in the field of space exploration, uh, build the infrastructure here and uh, for a sustainable outer space exploration. We started our mission with uh, LEO satellites, Earth observation satellites, but now we want to go into uh, outer space and uh, outer space exploration. We want to establish more and more international uh, collaboration and partnership with uh, international entities in space exploration. And we want to improve and further develop the engineering capability that we have been developing uh, so far, and specifically on the academic sector. And uh, on this program, uh, we have been working with these universities and there was a huge uh, knowledge transfer given to uh, our entity and uh, the, in general, the. Uh, and also the space agency and also different sectors here in the UAE. So the scientific mission objectives, objectives of this uh, mission is focused on the Martian atmosphere. And uh, there were three main uh, questions to, under, uh, to understand and answer. Uh, the first one was to understand the climate uh, dynamics and the global weather map through characterizing the lower atmosphere of Mars. The second one was to explain how the weather changes the escape of hydrogen and oxygen through correlating the lower atmosphere conditions with the upper atmosphere. And the third one would be to understand the structure and variability of hydrogen and oxygen and why do they escape the Martian atmosphere. And uh, through these scientific goals, we have taken uh, the, uh, the typical approach that is taken by all the science community in developing uh, scientific missions uh, for space exploration. And we came up with uh, the uh, following scientific goals also uh, in, where, in which we will communicate and share our, our findings with the uh, Mars science uh, community. Uh, we will study why Mars is losing its upper atmosphere to space. And we will investigate the connection between the lower and upper uh, Martian atmosphere. We will create the first global picture of how the Martian atmosphere changes through the day and through the day and between the seasons. So this mission is, uh, uh, one full year, uh, Martian year, I mean, and it will give us all the seasons, day and night, 
uh, coverage of the uh, Martian atmosphere and collection of data on, Mar on the Martian atmosphere. And this will be the first time this is done on a, on a single mission. And then it will observe the weather uh, phenomena such as dust storms, uh, changes in temperature, and how the atmosphere interacts with the topography uh, of the uh, atmosphere. Itself. We have three uh, main uh, science instruments. Uh, one is called EMIRS, which has an infrared uh, detector. The second one is the uh, EXI, which has a higher resolution uh, camera, which will be taking uh, photos of the, uh, of the Martian uh, atmosphere and Mars itself. And the third one is EMUSE, which, ha which has an ultraviolet uh, detector to also support the scientific uh, data collection uh, on the Martian atmosphere. It has been uh, uh, a great journey since 2014, the announcement of this mission. Uh, the UAE Space Agency, along with Mohammed Barashi Space Center, along with all the uh, entities and uh, scientific uh, partners that we had, uh, around 440 engineers, experts, and technicians were working together hand in hand to develop this mission with more than uh, 12,000 uh, tasks completed in six years. And that around it to about uh, five and a half million hours of work. Uh, we had uh, a very strong message to all uh, the science and engineering communities around the world that we believe in the capabilities of females. And we had uh, more than 34% participation uh, of female uh, engineers and scientists. And when it came to science, we had actually almost 90% uh, female uh, doing the science work behind this mission. And another achievement was for this mission was to localize the development of these uh, high-end uh, cutting-edge technologies uh, where we developed 66 components of this uh, uh, probe here in the UAE, uh, benefiting and utilizing the uh, capabilities of the local industry here. Uh, we had 15 international uh, partnerships and uh, on different categories, on different uh, sectors in this uh, project, uh, from science to engineering to uh, uh, the uh, hosting of different uh, professors and scientists to workshops to organizing these workshops. And along with uh, the, the work that we participated in, in the international uh, conferences, uh, there was a strong, uh, as one of the objectives, there was a very strong uh, push towards changing the, the, the concept and the idea uh, and the way people think here in the UAE towards uh, science and technology. And we have done several, and uh, I, I couldn't count the number of workshops and events that we have participated in or organized uh, up to where we reached more than 60,000 students and teachers were engaged in our outreach program. And with that kind of activities, uh, the, the, whole, uh, the, the, the whole society has changed its view on science and technology and importance of uh, pushing the, the next generation also towards uh, science and technology and uh, the, the, the need for that, that kind of uh, uh, culture to be adapted in the people living here and around uh, us in the region and around the world. So this was a brief uh, about the mission. And uh, as we said, next week on the 15th of July, uh, the launch will be happening from the Tanigashima Space Center. Um, after the launch itself, uh, star trackers will be guiding uh, the probe to reach uh, the Mars uh, orbit inception uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, attitude or orbit and or position. And that would be in February uh, next year. Uh, throughout this mission, definitely we will be utilizing the support of NASA in the deep space network to communicate with the probe. Uh, I believe several other uh, countries uh, also are planning to launch uh, probes or landers or rovers uh, to Mars uh, this year, so it's a, a busy traffic uh, towards Mars, but hopefully all of these missions will find the success and will act uh, collectively to 
uh, improve our understanding and knowledge uh, on the Martian uh, atmosphere and Mars uh, in general. Uh, just quick numbers on the speed. I think these are more of uh, uh, common knowledge to more many of you here, but uh, in terms of the, the velocity that we will go, the escape velocity, and then going toward Mars at 121,000 kilometers per hour. It's a very long distance in millions and millions of uh, kilometers. And uh, we will be, as we said, using uh, deep space network for the communication. And eventually around Mars, we will go into a science orbit where we will have an elliptical shape orbit with uh, very low inclination, around 15 or 17. And uh, Perigee at 20,000 kilometer and uh, Apogee at 43,000 uh, kilometer. And uh, the contacts will be happening uh, at limited uh, hours twice a week uh, for seven or eight hours uh, every week. And in general, just a quick uh, number, which is the, the mass of the spacecraft is around uh, 1,350 kilogram. Almost half of it is only fuel to take us to Mars and to uh, insert the probe into the Martian uh, orbit. So yes, please stay tuned next week and uh, all the best to uh, uh, all the scientists and uh, engineers around the world. And uh, hopefully together we will have uh, more collaboration, more understanding of the universe that as uh, our colleague here uh, mentioned also, the more we know around us, the more technologies we develop eventually goes back to Earth. It goes back to uh, serving humanity and making our life better here on Earth. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, listening to me. And uh, hopefully I give uh, informative and uh, a new information for you guys. Thank you. Good. Thank Best you. wishes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, all of your mission. Very exciting. Wish you all the luck for your launch next week. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, also reminding us on the importance of uh, collaboration, international cooperation. It's amazing and very inspiring what the UAE has accomplished. Good luck with your endeavors. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Peter Martinez. He's the exec executive director of Secure World Foundation. Today, he will share with us uh, space and sustainability uh, many challenges to ensuring the sustainability of outer space activities in support of sustainable development. Welcome, Mr. Peter Martinez. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. So good morning or good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to participate in this uh, seminar today. And thank you for the invitation to present uh, some thoughts on uh, space sustainability and the role, the connection between space sustainability and sustainable development. Uh, my name is Peter Martinez. I'm the executive director of Secure World Foundation. For those of you who may not have uh, encountered our organization before, we are a private operating foundation based in the United States, but with a global footprint in terms of our activities. We work with governments, uh, industry, um, international organizations, and civil society to develop ideas and actions to promote the sustainable use of outer space so that we can all continue to enjoy the benefits that we have uh, become accustomed to from space technology. So when uh, we uh, talk about space activities, uh, indeed, most people who aren't in the space sector uh, would normally think about things like the ISS or um, the fantastic missions that have given us so much insights about the universe, like the Hubble Space Telescope or interplanetary exploration. And we've, we've just heard a, uh, a fascinating talk by Amir al Ghafri about the, um, the HOPE mission, and I wish them all the very best uh, for this. I shall certainly be watching the launch with great interest. 
But um, so we've learned a lot about the universe uh, during the first uh, 60 years of the space age, and it has enriched our life on Earth uh, immensely. But of course, the planet that matters most to us is the planet that we all actually live on. And indeed, the vast majority of satellites put into space are um, placed there to provide services to people on the ground. And I, I need hardly to repeat to the audience of this uh, event today just how critically reliant uh, we all are personally on the continuity of space data and services. So, so space has become an essential component of addressing global challenges such as climate change and also addressing global agendas such as Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and many of you, are, of course, are familiar with this uh, uh, this iconic uh, representation of the 17 SDGs. And we all know that satellites can provide um, very important services to realize these. Earlier on in this uh, uh, symposium, uh, Luc Saint Pierre from UNUSA mentioned that 40% of the SDGs uh, can be directly uh, supported by space applications. So um, at the moment, we have about 2,800 satellites uh, providing these services to people on the ground. And actually, as of a few hours from now, if all goes well with the SpaceX launch, we will be just over 2,900 satellites um, uh, providing uh, operational um, services from space. But in addition to these, we also have about 34,000 objects the size of a coffee cup or larger um, these are uh, space debris from the, um, the first uh, 50 or 60 years of the space age. And of course, just as the distribution of material on the beach where you have large, a few large boulders, lots of stones, millions of sand grains and so on, the distribution of this um, uh, anthrop uh, anthropogenic material in space follows the same pattern. And so we have uh, a much larger number of objects in size, one to 10 centimeters, and um, millions of objects smaller than that. And this all raises concerns for the future sustainability of space activities uh, in terms of the safety of space operations. Just to very quickly give you a kind of a visual depiction of the evolution of the orbital environment, you can see here that um, as the decades have gone by that our low Earth uh, orbit environment shown on the left and uh, the geostationary uh, arc on the right have become more and more crowded. And um, we have now many, many of these satellites are no longer providing useful functions and are in fact just debris that uh, render no useful purpose and are a, a hazard to operational satellites. Um, recent data from the um, Union of Concerned Scientists, they keep a catalog of, of space objects. Their most recent update was published in April. Um, they have about um, 1,900 uh, operational satellites in LEO, about 130 in medium Earth orbit, uh, and um, about 550 in the geostationary arc. Many of the numbers that I will give to you in this presentation will be updated uh, shortly just because of the very rapid pace of developments. Now, if you look at the distribution of this orbital debris uh, or orbital material, um, this chart shows you the evolution of this um, uh, material in orbit where you can see the number of payloads um, indicated uh, with the red um, uh, bars at the bottom. But then you also have other um, uh, objects uh, such as uh, payload fragmentation debris uh, or mission related debris. These are things like uh, mirror covers and so on that are cast off or used to be cast off. Um, people try nowadays not to, to reduce the amount of material uh, that is mission related debris. And then of course you have fragmentations of rockets um, and, uh, and upper stages and so on. So that's the one issue is, the, is the, um, the crowding of the orbital environment. Another major issue is that space is becoming much more global, which is a very good thing. This, is, this map shows the number of space uh, actors or countries that were active in the space arena in 1966. And um, you can see that um, jumping ahead 
to 2016, you can see how the picture has changed. We now have many, many more countries that are active participants in space activities. Um, over 30 countries have national space agencies now. Uh, close on 90 countries have launched and operated their own satellites. Um, and we currently have um, the European Space Agency plus 11 other countries that are capable of launching satellites into space. So space is becoming much more global, not only in terms of the, the participation, but also the geopolitics of space. This is a slide that shows one of the early meetings of the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which was established in 1959 with 24 members. And um, that was uh, even then uh, a small fraction of the total uh, membership of the United Nations. Fast forward to 2019, where um, the committee currently has uh, 95 member states and every year it receives applications from several countries uh, wishing to join the committee, which illustrates the importance attached to space by a growing number of countries. Another issue is that we have new kinds of actors. This slide shows the evolution of space actors uh, from the beginning of the space age until um, uh, recent years. And you can see here the, in the bottom of the slide, the, the, the red and orange color shows the, uh, the Russian uh, civilian and military uh, launches respectively. So the red is Russian military, orange is Russian civilian. And then above that, you see the United States in dark blue military and light blue civilian launches. And you can see the early decades of the space age were dominated by um, military uses of space. But gradually the civilian uses um, uh, increased. And also you start seeing in the 70s that um, yellow band, which is other nations becoming space actors. But what is most striking is the green band, which shows the emergence of the private sector. And you can see towards the right hand corner of the diagram, how significant the private sector has become as a space actor and therefore how important it is to involve private sector expertise in the development of regulations for outer space activities. We also have new kinds of space activities um, emerging all the time now. Um, this is a slide that is depicting uh, things like uh, close proximity operations like on-orbit servicing, um, so things like uh, inspections, life extensions, and on-orbit repair. Um, we also are seeing the emergence of things like uh, space mission resources um, uh, work and also um, things like uh, active debris removal. All of these new kinds of space operations raise various security concerns because of the dual use nature of these capabilities. Another issue that is shaping the space arena is the emergence of the so-called mega constellations. This is a slide that I've taken from a graphic in Space News that came out a year or two ago, showing the number of mega constellations that were being um, planned at that time. And indeed, um, if, you, if, if all of the applications for these mega constellations come to life, and I personally don't believe they all will, but if they do, you're looking at 57,000 satellites planned through to um, 2029. Now, even if, even if just 10% of these satellites get built, that's still another 5,700 satellites we can expect in orbit on top of what is there already. Another concern, and this is a very, um, uh, a very serious one for the growing uses of space, is the proliferation of counter space capabilities around the world. As more and more countries rely on space for their militaries, um, we are seeing therefore attention being paid to protecting military assets. And a number of countries have, uh, are working on counter space capabilities. These fall into various categories such as kinetic physical, which means um, uh, either direct ascent ASATs or co-orbital ASATs or, or ground station attacks. We're also seeing non-kinetic physical, counter space like uh, electromagnetic or laser uh, or microwave uh, um, interference. Then you can have electronic um, uh, forms of attack such as spoofing or jamming and then finally cyber. Those are all 
causes of great concern, especially the debris producing uh, anti-satellite activities. Another area of concern is space weather. We heard from uh, one of the previous speakers about the miniaturization of space components, which of course lowers the cost of barriers. And this of course has great benefits, but because the components are smaller, they also become more susceptible to space weather. And this is especially an issue for um, CubeSats and, and other spacecraft developed by space actors with very limited budgets and uh, one wants to avoid a situation where satellites die very shortly after going in orbit and become just first degree. Now, in the next few minutes, I'll focus on some of the solutions. Um, of course, there uh, are scientific and technical solutions to many of these issues. Uh, this is a depiction that I took from uh, the ESA website showing one possible solution for removal of space debris. All sorts of ideas have been proposed, nets, harpoons, magnets, lasers. I don't have time to go into it, but um, this is a, a growing uh, opportunity for technology and commercial um, uh, uh, benefit. Um, another area that I think we can look to for solutions apart from technology is developing norms of responsible behavior. Um, I use the analogy of traffic. In the early days when there were very few people with cars, um, the motorists could more, more or less um, watch out for each other and avoid collisions. But as more and more people started acquiring cars, we needed to develop rules of the road, norms of responsible behavior, and, um, and also um, uh, to, to avoid uh, chaos and, and, uh, and accidents. And so it is in space that we need norms of behavior in space, um, both for civilian and for military users of space. And there are at the moment uh, a number of initiatives to develop such norms, both by the military community, but also by civilian actors. Um, for example, uh, civilian actors have come together in two initiatives. One is called CONFERS, the Consortium for the Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations. Um, this is a, a consortium of commercial actors, uh, international consortium, that is developing rules for close proximity operations. Another is the Space Safety Coalition, also an international group that is promoting adherence to best practices, standards, and guidelines. And so this is one area. On the, on the um, defense side, there are initiatives uh, called Milamos uh, and, um, and, and also one by um, uh, another group called the Woomera Initiative that are looking at developing manuals for how militaries should um, uh, behave in these kinds of situations. Then uh, another a very important area is uh, policy and regulation. Uh, the United Nations system addresses space security uh, primarily in the forum um, called the Conference on Disarmament and the peaceful uses of outer space in the UN Corpus Forum, which is the one depicted on the slide. Both of those have addressed these issues. The uh, first committee has addressed uh, the issue of transparency and confidence building measures and adopted a consensus report in 2013. In 2019, COPUS adopted a set of guidelines for the long-term sustainability of outer space. Um, this was a, uh, a massive eight-year effort that culminated in a set of 21 guidelines, which we are now working uh, both with uh, government and, um, uh, and industry partners to promote as widely as possible. So these are some of the, I hope I've given you an idea of some of the current challenges that we are experiencing in the space domain that may hinder uh, its, uh, our ability to use it for sustainable development, but also a number of solutions, both technical, scientific, uh, and regulatory that we can use. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Martinez, for sharing with us the challenges and solutions to uh, sustainable space. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Professor Bernard Foink. He is a senior scientist at the European Space Agency, also director at ILEWG Euro Moon Mars in Netherlands. Okay. Hello. So welcome to everybody from from Earth. Now I'm going. Do you hear me? Do you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so from uh, Earth, 
I'll talk about uh, Moon and Mars and how together we can uh, uh, go sustainably and uh, together as a global village of uh, inhabitants of Earth, of astronauts from Earth, seven and a half billion here, and how going uh, to the Moon and Mars and having some activities uh, there uh, can benefit uh, the whole uh, humankind. So um, this is uh, prepared with a, a group of uh, young uh, Moon and Mars explorers uh, that uh, uh, are helping me. And uh, we started a program so 11 years ago called Your Moon Mars, where we have a special program to do research, to do technology, also to uh, 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 develop uh, opportunities for young Moon and Mars explorers and um, also to bridge to society. And actually I put them as quotas. So every year we have a, a core of young Moon and Mars explorers, young professionals, and I have put their names there from the last uh, uh, four years. But we had a good community. We worked also with a, a number of universities, with the Space Generation Advisory Council, with the ISU uh, for, for that. So, um, what about the Moon and Mars? Actually, I was fortunate working at the European Space Agency to be the father of uh, our first uh, mission to the Moon. The first mission of this millennium, Smart One, was launched in 2003. And a, a small mission for advanced research and technology uh, that we launched and uh, that uh, used the uh, miniaturized payload, also uh, that to use the technique of uh, ion propulsion to go into deep space. So we were there, and uh, so we arrived on the, around the moon in 2005, and we stayed there one year and a half until uh, an impact it was observed uh, worldwide, and that also engaged uh, uh, many uh, people around the world. And what we have learned with a smart one is that uh, at the end, it was not only for the science and the technology, but the great, great impact of smart one was to engage the public and the youth. And we have got a lot of interest from this youngster. Also, we used uh, this mission, Smart One, to educate uh, the public and the youth about uh, science, planetary science, space science. What does it take to shape rocky planets? So we have wrinkles on planets, we have craters, we have volcanism, we have uh, very special uh, polar regions uh, there, which are very special condition uh, with uh, uh, some permanent shadow area and ice, and even, okay, we. Uh, uh, could uh, observe our own impact on the surface of the moon. Uh, and this was observed worldwide. And we created the first uh, uh, lunar sculpture of this uh, millennium. And uh, we are going to try to look for the fingerprints of the, um, the remain of the smart one spacecraft there. Also, we looked at places where in the future we could set robotic bases, robotic village, and human villages. And we made a map, a mosaic map of the pole of the moon. So if you go to the moon, you can take this map with you and this will help you to navigate in some areas where you can watch the earth on the near side, but also on the far side areas where we found ice and so on. Even more, we found at proximity from the South Pole, a peak of eternal light, a place which is high enough that the sun is most, okay, 100% uh, of the summer and 80% of the winter, the sun is visible from there. So there you would have a place where you'd have solar power forever. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, challenge, very interesting real estate. Um, to whom does it belong? Of course, it belongs to humankind, to us, but how can you make use of this place to uh, benefit uh, the whole community for science, technology, and also commercial development and exploration on the moon and beyond. So after Smart One, we have been uh, collaborating also with a number of countries that developed their own orbital village around the moon. So with uh, uh, China, with uh, Japan that had their own uh, probes, also with uh, India that developed the Chandrayaan probe on which actually ESA put a free uh, instrument on board and NASA put two instruments. So clearly de facto we have built an orbital village around the moon that has been operating continuously now since uh, 2007. And this goes in the way of a vision that we have expressed already 20, more than 20 years ago with the International Lunar Exploration Working Group that was formed on the auspices of COSPAR, but with uh, uh, all space agencies, with uh, also space uh, 
industries, academia, and uh, that expressed a sustainable roadmap to explore the moon, starting with this orbital precursor, done that, but then next step is a robotic village where you have a various assets developed by various countries and also various uh, actors, including the commercial actors, towards a sustainable, permanent international lunar base where we could use the resources to the benefit actually of all humankind. And this has uh, uh, inspired us so uh, 10 years ago to try to work on this ourselves. So with a group of young lunar explorers, we built a lander and this was inspired by a Google Lunar X Prize competition at that time. So we did that with uh, uh, some uh, entrepreneur companies and uh, some uh, students. We put some instrument in it. We put some telescope on it. These are tele-operated from a little uh, laboratory that we have built like uh, in a mini moon habitat that we have built at STEC. And uh, we organized uh, twice per year uh, some Your Moon Mars workshop where we uh, mixed the whole community of scientists, engineers, but also um, we had artists, designers, we had uh, lawyers, we had even artists uh, that uh, join us, even botanists that were looking how to grow plants on the moon. So we went to the next step, how to prepare together this robotic village. So we built also uh, some um, rovers that uh, work like the family of rovers. And this is a great topic also for international cooperation and sustainable because you can have uh, now very advanced technology of uh, uh, miniaturized rovers that is available all over the world, uh, also for uh, young public, which uh, are um, also inspired to develop uh, new technologies and new IT. We even tested, uh, this is not exactly the moon, but this was a moon uh, uh, analog that we have close to us, a volcano, where we deployed this uh, lander together with uh, an astronaut developed by the Australian Space Forum. So now, how to go towards this robotic village? So for instance, the DLR, German Aerospace Agencies, developed, uh, built uh, a mock-up of, uh, of a lander and intelligent rovers that we deployed in a very good analog of the moon. That's the Etna volcano in, in um, Sicily. And so we tested these various system, intelligent rovers that are getting ready to go on the surface of the moon as part of the robotic village and <laughs> that will be exploring and doing science and scouting places for the future. So this was very well supported at the top of the DLR. You can see here the, uh, the CEO of the DLR that was part of this uh, campaign with our staff. And uh, we are preparing now a campaign for next year in June 2021, where we'll have also under DLR and ESA some big simulation of uh, what would be in International Robotic Village, and we would like to invite you there. De facto, the Robotic Village has started because in 2013, we had a beautiful uh, Chinese uh, lander on the near side of the moon that is still in operation permanently after more than six years. And it deployed a rover, U2, the, the Jade Rabbit, that uh, exp explored and measured uh, scientifically some uh, of the ground. This was done again at the beginning of 2019, where the brother of this lander and the rovers were landed on the far side of the moon, world first. So if you look at the next years, we have really concrete steps for this lunar robotic village. Uh, you have a, a series of missions in the next years by uh, countries, but also by commercial ventures. And it will be very interesting uh, opportunities to uh, uh, cooperate on the area of science, also on, on the technologies, also on, um, on the peaceful uh, effect of working together and. Uh, uh, both for the robotic side, but also we will have humans around the moon very soon, possibly around 2022, 2023. And we are looking forward also the first women on the moon in 2024. After 24 people went around the moon and 12 of them landed on the moon and no women, we think it's really time now to have the first women on the moon and to have also the expression of the moon and Mars as a message for uh, gender equality, for diversity, and for inspiring the whole world. So that's also part of the vision for uh, the, uh, the moon village, which is to establish a sustainable presence on the moon. And uh, here you have some iconic views of what could be some intermediate steps where we would make use of some of the resources. We could 3D print some of our habitat. And so we have also 
to master some challenges for this moon village implementation. Of course, you have to get there safely with good rocket, good landers. We have to communicate with us. We have to operate in this extreme condition. You have to survive. This is especially for astronauts. They like to survive and be able to come back, but also for all the equipment. Um, we want to move to explore areas around and uh, because it's, uh, the moon is like a continent, it's, it's the size of Africa. And so there are many things to explore. It's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, and also there are resources, resources of the material kind, but mostly resources of the spiritual kind, knowledge, uh, inspiration of young people that will be able, for instance, to teleport rovers from Earth and they will have a virtual presence there. There will be a place for humans, for robots, and we are able to exploit resources there, not only the soil, but also the water ice uh, for life support system, but also for making fuel for a rocket that will go at a cost 50 times in energy less than if you launch from Earth. And they will be our gateway to the whole solar system, but also could be a gateway to have a, a fuel rocket that could maintain the whole infrastructure of application satellite around the Earth uh, with a very big new market. And the novelty into this approach that is not to be paid only by government, but also we are partnering with users that could pay 80% of the bill because this is going to generate so much benefits and services for the whole humankind. So now going back of how can we make it happen at a little scale? We have built a little moon laboratory. So this was built at Estec and we use to test what type of equipment you could run there. So we have analysis of sample. We have even a 3D printer. So if you forget something, uh, to bring something on the moon, you can 3D print it. Uh, uh, you don't need to wait five days. And so we are training some young professional to live like they would be in a moon base. We uh, train them also to handle uh, the protocol of planetary protection, you know, uh, how um, you avoid to contaminate uh, the, uh, the moon and Mars in the future and back contamination of Earth. But also on the moon, it's a lab to bring life. So how you could grow plants, uh, culture, life, and uh, learn how life can be adapted to another place in the solar system. So we also train them this protocol in this small uh, uh, portable laboratory. But also we conducted uh, every year some campaign in uh, extreme desert in, uh, on Earth uh, that are analog to the moon and Mars, where we can perform laboratory or field research. We can demonstrate instruments. We can test some technologies of habitat, in particular sustainable habitat for energy, water recycle, how to live in confinement, isolation, and all the, this human aspect. And this is used as an opportunity to train young uh, professionals, but also advanced professionals, because it's also there's a lot of knowledge we have to transfer from generation to generation. And we use that also as a platform for outreach and inspiration. So we had campaign. So you have six uh, crew in a, in, a, in a team and, and they say two weeks on the moon or Mars. And here it's a, a place where we can really connect also uh, uh, learn about Mars better. This on the top you have images we obtained with Mars Express. This was our big brother for hope. Uh, so good luck to hope. And uh, we uh, also have uh, landscapes on Earth that are very similar to Mars, and they tell us about the ancient water history of Mars. And interestingly, on those places, we have access to the samples that we can analyze, and you can better than understand Mars samples and Martian history in terms of water, but also in terms of uh, um, the past uh, possible life. So we brought a series of uh, experiments on board, so X-ray experiment, infrared, and so on, microscopy that uh, were developed uh, between ESA and also NASA uh, collaborators in some universities. We also uh, performed uh, some uh, simulation for extravehicular activities where, uh, so this is for instance, deploying a radar from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the miniature, uh, trying to operate a drill. And it takes three astronauts in a scaphander to operate a drill on Mars. So that's much harder, but uh, we can prove that we were able to take a subsurface sample that tells you also about the history of uh, of the place and it to be applicable to the future in the sample we would like to get on Mars or eventually also in some of these polar ice deposits that we have found on the moon. So we have also uh, performed some campaign uh, near to us in, you know, near Holland where I live, there is a volcano that exploded recently, only 10,000 years ago, all over Europe. And so we go there 
and we use that as a field to train uh, for uh, operation on the moon and Mars. So we go there every year to train the students also on the technical side. It's close to the European Astronaut Center. So I would like to, if your audience is interested, please contact me and we can put you uh, to join some of our next uh, campaign. We try also to organize other campaign in other parts of the world. So this is a, this is a volcano that in one week just uh, created 25 meters of ashes and you can uh, measure them with uh, our instrument. So that's what we have seen. Also, we explored uh, lava tubes. On the moon and Mars, we have found lava tubes. And these are places where we could have a, a safe habitat for humans, protected from radiation, for meteors. And so we made some of this uh, experiment in, in a subsurface. So this is a big la uh, gallery in this Eiffel region. This is a lava tube entrance in La Réunion Island also. La Réunion and Hawaii have very specific hot spot of the Earth and they have conditions very similar to the moon and Mars. So, so we have got a number of uh, expeditions in caves and actually even in time of confinement, just after the deconfinement, we have uh, uh, organized a, a recent campaign in Iceland with uh, some of our team, but uh, we are going to some of these subsurface areas. So we, we have done that every year. This was in a cave in the Alps, in the Austrian Alps, which is an ice cave where we tested some protocol of taking sample of astrobiology uh, interest. If, for instance, we want to explore an ice cave on Mars. So this was done with an astronaut. This is this cave here on Earth. Um, we had also last year a campaign uh, organized in the frame of ESA Lab. So it's a network of uh, university uh, uh, laboratories where you form students to develop a team all over Europe uh, uh, working on this project. And the first pilot project was to build an habitat in uh, a moon habitat in a glacier in, the, in Switzerland. So it was some of this campaign. So you had the robots, you had the growing plants, you had a number of experiments. We even brought our uh, moon lander there on the top of the glacier. We had uh, here some views from the uh, campaign that we performed in Iceland. It's a great place that in some places look really like the moon with a volcanic world, but also uh, as ice. So it's very similar to Mars. So we have done a number of campaigns as well with uh, uh, some uh, uh, various uh, groups, uh, like with Space Generation of the Council, with a group in Poland that developed an habitat in Poland. And this is, uh, we brought our lander there, but also we uh, had a confinement where you had this uh, six crew spending two weeks on the moon. You see the, the picture was taken before they went, they are still very happy. And actually we took a picture after, they are still happy because we fed them with food grown on the place. And this is very important from the diet point of view, also from the psychological, they could take care of their plants. And we have done also this study, how it's important to bring with you a bit of your uh, uh, whole uh, uh, earth uh, when you go to the moon and Mars. We were also doing experiments where we learn how to grow plants out of, uh, uh, out of uh, moon soil and in what condition you could develop some robotic gardener and helping the astronaut. So now I would like to end with uh, some of the latest stage of a new uh, uh, set of simulation we have performed in Hawaii, which is a very good analog for the moon and Mars. So this was performed on the, uh, near the summit of the Mauna Loa volcano, where uh, there is a base which was uh, uh, built uh, by the International Moon Base Alliance. It was used by NASA for long-term simulation of eight months, 12 months simulation. And now we have, uh, um, uh, you are using it mostly for short-term simulation of two weeks to uh, only a few months, in particular targeted uh, to develop new technologies, instrument, and also to learn how to live on the moon and Mars. So we have uh, uh, done some number of campaigns. Myself, I went there, I joined the Hank Rogers with the owner of this uh, facility, but also he's the founder of the International Moon Base Alliance. And we brought some equipment there, drone, um, extravehicular activities, rover, the sample analysis instrument. We explored there the area. We discovered a number of lava tubes around. And then we uh, returned them now recurrently. And we are looking for volunteers for the next campaign, which we are organizing next year. So that's a, uh, please, if you're interested, please contact us at your moon Mars. We look at a diversity of profile, all countries welcome. And uh, we have a campaign uh, of two weeks, but in particular, we'll have a one year moon Mars campaign at the end of the year. So you go, you arrive there, we have a, uh, um, this is inside the moon base. 
a good life, you know, it's a good equipment for time with us. Also, also, this is a view of the moon base from space, and you can see the it's all, all sustainable uh, with solar panels. It can have its own energy, and uh, we try also to test their technologies for sustainable uh, um, uh, sustainable development that will be of interest also in other extreme places on Earth. So uh, there we build also a, a mission control that in Blue Planet, the an uh, area which is uh, a bit lower uh, in Hawaii, and I've been serving as a flight control director there, and letting my student to do the hard work of astronaut and EDA after I've done it the year before. But uh, they have some good time. They learn how to cook food out of space ingredients. So they make bread only of uh, of a dry uh, food. So that's, that's we, we try to maintain them in good psychological uh, profile in and confinement, that's a good lesson they've learned also for this hard time we have now with COVID. And then we have some operation preparing for extravehicular activity. Here they had to uh, repair an antenna which broke down. Here they have to explore some uh, surface uh, lava, which uh, are very similar to what you would find on the moon. Here are two geology students that are making sample analysis. They discovered some lava tubes and they explore them inside, also testing new technologies for going under the surface. And uh, so that's uh, some of the geologists that work. They even found some microbial activities there that's very interesting in the in perspective of Mars. Here so they are taking samples. And um, so that day by day. And so um, you are welcome to join that. And eventually we went to visit them inside the, the base with a real cosmonaut, Oleg Artemiev, that uh, has flown to the space station with the inventor also of the game Tetris. And uh, uh, we went after this to bring some of this good uh, inspiration for uh, space and for use uh, to the governors of Hawaii in a special event uh, that uh, took place after this. So this is another aspect very important that we, we want to cultivate, how to engage all everybody, uh, also uh, talking to the politician, but also with outreach to the public. And we have also developed a special pilot project in the frame of a platform, which is called Art Moon Mars, where we have a number of events, exhibition, lectures with artists and designers. And this project is to send a moon gallery, the first museum on the moon. And we want to send 100 pieces of art to the surface of the moon. Now I am in contact with some lenders company and they asked me 1 million euro per kilo. So what we have decided, we have designed a facility which is only 10 by 10 centimeter. Each art piece is one cubic centimeter. And this is what we try to send to the moon as also an image of a contribution from um, artists, but also scientists or uh, explorers or thinkers from the whole world. So our first generation of moon gallery, we have already more than 50 artists. If you're interested you, to put a, a piece of art science an artifact, please contact us. We'd like to have you on board. And we have a, a number of events that we organize all over the world. Uh, at different places with uh, exhibition in big. And the latest one was one we organized here in Amsterdam, just after the end of the confinement where we were allowed again to have uh, some uh, meetings with social distance. And you can see that we could, uh, 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 all this event, also we invited a few Apollo astronauts uh, to uh, enact uh, the, um, the situation of deploying this moon gallery. So as a conclusion, uh, yes, to get everybody on uh, the moon and Mars, from Earth, there are ways to prepare this moon Mars village on Earth. You have some aspect where you study instrument technologies for the robotic village. There are all the human aspects you can study by designing new facilities for the future, uh, which are very optimized for this isolated environment. But you look also at all the human factors of having a team that will be very international working there. And also we try to engage the rest of the society by with debates or also with events such as this Art Moon Mars platform. So thank you very much for your attention and I invite you yeah, to go all uh, to the moon and Mars, even if we stay on Earth, but uh, for a sustainable and uh, engaging everybody on Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Benar, for your passionate presentation and all <laughs> the contribution. Uh, and highlighting also the importance of diversity and uh, uh, equality with all of the work and all of the many initiatives uh, we 
you presented to us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Our next speaker is Mrs. Svetlana Vachrina. She's the marketing director of Prosto Cosmos LLC in Russia. Good day, everybody. Today she will be sharing uh, the importance of motivating the youth towards scientific achievements in the footsteps of Russian space pioneers. The podium is yours, Svetlana. Are you on? Uh, yes, I'm trying to uh, switch on my presentation. Just a second. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Full screen, if you like. Okay. Um, first of all, it's an honor for me to participate in this e symposium online Zoom meeting, as we used to have for the recent three months or so. And it is an honor for me to be in a company of scientists, engineers, and um, uh, valued persons. Uh, and to conclude this uh, symposium, uh, I would like to come back to the, to the beginning. Uh, to the beginning of space, of space discoveries, and uh, as you all know, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, now Russia, uh, was uh, one of pioneers in discovering space. Uh, so my topic today uh, is uh, how to motivate the young generation, the youth, towards scientific achievements uh, following the steps of Russian space pioneers. And um, to start with, I should say that uh, all parents want their children to be successful. And um, it's true that uh, flights to space, to moon, to Mars, to ISS, uh, is a symbol uh, of a dream to come true. So our mission and mission of my colleagues is to popularize world cosmonautics and to make people, especially young people, dream big. Open up new possibilities of learning and exploring space. So since we have a huge historic background of uh, exploring space, uh, we use some instruments and tools how we motivate um, young generations. Uh, first of all, uh, space industry, space, uh, Russian space industry unites uh, more than uh, 76 enterprises and uh, almost 250,000 employees all over the country. Uh, that's why we can guarantee the unique experience in preparation humans for the space flights. Uh, we have historic heritage with the first cosmonauts and first person to go out of space and to popularize new space program. So to start with, you have a picture of Gagarin with his famous phrase in Russian, Payekhali, that means let's go. Uh, it is his famous phrase uh, on a starting pad. Uh, so number one, uh, for successful, children for successful person and successful generation, we try to create as many successful situation uh, as possible. What I mean, first of all, we um, bring kids and school children, uh, children and students to our museums and uh, historic space place to uh, make them acquainted uh, with the space heroes like Gagarin, like Korolev, the greatest instructor of spacecrafts, like Mr. Leonov, who uh, was the first to make the um, uh, entry to the outer space. Uh, and uh, currently, we experience um, online and offline meetings with current cosmonauts and astronauts. Uh, I believe that uh, no thing can make such impression on people like a person. So when you talk to a person, when you feel his experience, 
his uh, background, his heroism, then can motivate you for, for new action. So one of instruments is to meet real cosmonauts, real engineers, real people who into the industry right now. Uh, as one of the target places uh, is uh, the uh, Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, uh, which we call the place of birth of space uh, industry uh, in Russia and all over the world. This is the place where humans are still getting ready for their space flight. Uh, for students and school children, we uh, worked out a special, um, a special program, which we call International Space Camp, which is unite um, their um, real world um, experience with science, technology, engineering, math, astronomy, and also see how uh, humans can be ready for the flight. So this is one of the highlights, highlights to visit and to feel uh, the real place of space. So uh, how can I tell? Uh, number two, uh, instrument of motivation. Uh, we go from small to big effort and every effort uh, should be noted. Uh, for example, for small kids starting from early age, we experience master classes for um, uh, rocket construction. So they start with small, small things to motivate themselves to learn more how Mr. Korolev and other engineers came to create the biggest vehicle. Some people, believe me, even adults, cannot imagine how big the rocket uh, is in reality. So we try to bring this knowledge from young people to elders. And the students also can construct real models. They can start from the uh, moderate starting, play, uh, static, starting pad and demonstrate their knowledge in physics, um, science, uh, chemistry, um, so to, to bring them closer to the universities and the education at the universities. Um, I should also mention that uh, still we have programs for students who develop their own startup projects. Uh, for example, um, in the field of satellites uh, that can send their project, their satellite, uh, with the cargo ship like Proton, uh, which carries uh, cargos to the ISS. So this, um, the, the, the project of students can be brought to ISS or to the open space, including this, um, uh, into, um, using these vehicles. And still Russia has big opportunities for student startups and student projects. Uh, what they bring you, we can show them in reality how this can work. Um, then, uh, number three, what we use uh, for motivation is uh, turn failures uh, into, um, into successful points. Uh, I put picture of Elon Musk uh, here to demonstrate that yes, he is a a uh, very famous person, but with some failures in his life that brought him to bigger success. Uh, so how we uh, implement it into reality is we bring kids and students uh, to uh, museums, to houses of um, Russian scientists, and uh, especially to the Gagarin training center, Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, to show them the story of um, successful and unsuccessful um, cases in space. Uh, we all know and why we call cosmonauts and astronauts real heroes, because they really uh, rely their lives on the shoulders of engineers and scientists. Um, 
to, to test the vehicle, to test the rocket, and to make some experiments uh, in ISS or in the outer space. So we would like kids and students uh, to know the, uh, the history of successful and unsuccessful stories and to understand that sometimes mistakes uh, can somehow stop um, the development of some pro program, but still uh, be the clue for the bigger success in, in the future. Um, in, in Moscow, uh, we have some um, places uh, must visit, so to say. It is the State Museum of Cosmonautics, uh, the Museum of uh, Astronomy, the House of Karolov and Gagarin, and the whole city, which we call Star City, uh, where the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center is located. So uh, as soon as you visit the place, anytime you can meet the real cosmonauts um, just alive. Uh, number four, uh, we are talking about motivation. Um, I repeat that uh, we, we try to, um, our mission is to motivate uh, school children, students, not only to go to space industry, but to, to think out of box, to dream big, uh, and uh, space heroes are the easiest examples to show how extraordinary ideas can come true. Uh, what we suggest uh, is to, to do, do it together and sincerely believe in your success. Uh, so what I mean by saying do it together. Uh, first of all, uh, we suggest programs for families so not only um, kids uh, or teenagers can uh, participate in the programs, but also they can do it together with their family, with their parents, friends, and the bigger society. So one of the uh, best places to, to see the rocket launch in reality is uh, the legendary, legendary Baikonur Cosmodrome. Uh, which is the, the historic cosmodrome and the place where uh, Gagarin uh, started. Uh, this is from this very, uh, from this very Gagarin starting pad, also the first UAE astronaut Haza Al-Mansuri started last year in 2019. Uh, and um, as, as many other astronauts and cosmonauts. Uh, so Baikonur is a place to see and to, uh, to see the rocket uh, from the distance of uh, less than 50 meters when they rolling out um, uh, to the starting pad. Uh, we do it together with families. Uh, and this is a picture demonstrating uh, the whole family to see the uh, mission control center and also Cosmodrome. Uh, we do um, corporate and family flights in zero gravity. Uh, this is also a unique opportunity for people not only to test themselves, but also to feel like real cosmonauts because with the modified airplane, EU-76, MDK, uh, which, uh, which, um, uh, which makes a flight according to some parabolas, and you can feel the zero gravity for some short time. But still, this is a real training for cosmonauts, and this is a real opportunity for us uh, to try this, um, to, to, to try this experience. And the last one uh, is, um, is you, if you dream big, then your victory must be significant. Uh, so as an example of uh, Hazal Mansouri, the first UAE um, uh, astronaut, uh, demonstrates that if you want something, you will achieve it. Uh, and after a year of training at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, uh, Mr. Hazal Mansouri, with uh, his backup, 
astronaut uh, finally uh, appeared to be at Baikonur and made his first flight. Uh, I do hope not the last one, and we uh, welcome uh, uh, Emirati astronauts and uh, guests from UAE and other countries. Uh, and also, uh, we try to bring closer family stories. Uh, on this picture, you see Mr. Uh, Shkaplerov. This is our uh, famous cosmonaut with his daughter, who is saying goodbye to his father before the flight. And this is a very tender picture showing that uh, all people in space industry, uh, they are doing very important work, very special that can, probably cannot be seen or felt, felt now. But this is for our future generations, for our future better life and uh, humans' uh, development in general. Uh, so to conclude my uh, presentation, I would like to highlight uh, what background uh, we, we have to motivate people, to motivate a uh, young generation to stay with science, first of all, to stay with space industry and to dream big and bigger and bigger every day. So we have uh, meetups with the cosmonauts and astronauts. Uh, in uh, Moscow and uh, Moscow area, we have biggest space museum in the world. Uh, we have the Gagarin Cosmonauts Training Center where you can really feel like a real cosmonaut and it's open to public and international guests. Uh, Baikonur, the legendary Cosmodrome, must visit place as long as uh, Cape Canaveral and um, other Cosmodromes uh, all, all over the world. Uh, zero gravity is the extreme experience for individuals and groups. Uh, for school children, uh, for school children and students, uh, we do organize international space camps and international um, convents and competitions for students, starting from easy tasks to very difficult projects with uh, rocket constructing and biological and uh, chemistry tests. Uh, and uh, the current situation uh, pushed us uh, to, to be quicker with uh, online quests and uh, edutainment immersive programs to bring as more people as possible to, to like space, to aim to space, and to, uh, to motivate themselves for, for bigger results, for higher results. Uh, as uh, Mr. Korolev said, almost more than 60 years ago, that there will come a time when a spaceship with people on board leaves the Earth and go on a journey. A reliable bridge from Earth to space has really been made and the road to the stars is open. It happened only 60 years ago and now our e-symposium uh, is about Mars, Moon and satellites all over the world, uh, all, over, all over the Earth. So this is how quickly and how far we move uh, on the background of our uh, heroes and pioneers of space. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I, um, I was not too quick <laughs> to express everything I wanted and uh, I think it was interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. SpaceX plans and others like OneWeb and Samsung and others planning to go. So is it going to create more debris in the future or can the gateway st stop the gateway for the future of space? Dr. Martinez, this question is for you. Thank you for that question. Um, yes, so uh, of course, uh, with the growing number of, of space objects, um, there are concerns about the sustainability of space, but the hope is that if uh, through collective action of uh, all countries together, 
we can avoid a situation where the low Earth orbit environment becomes unusable for future generations just because there is simply too much debris up there and it becomes a very high risk for, um, for space for satellite operators and therefore drives up mission costs. This provides uh, business opportunities for um, new uh, space actors to think about creative ways to um, uh, address the space debris problem. Of course, the best way uh, to uh, address this is to avoid creating the debris in the first place. This can be done through engineering and operational practices, um, but also um, things like, uh, when, I, when I say operational practices, I mean things like post-mission disposal, where at the end of a spacecraft's life, uh, the spacecraft is deorbited from low Earth orbit and therefore does not stay up there for a long time. Um, there has been for many years a uh, what is called a 25-year rule uh, for post-mission uh, um, uh, duration in orbit. Actually, this is not an international uh, um, uh, rule at all. It's, it's something that is just uh, widely accepted, but there is a growing view that uh, the post-mission life of objects in low Earth orbit should be far shorter than that, uh, possibly um, you know, less, less than five years even. Um, so uh, through, through a number of policy and, and uh, technical measures, uh, we hope that it will be possible to keep the low Earth orbit environment uh, usable uh, as we see more and more space actors entering space. Thank you, uh, Dr. Martinez. Here's a question for the space tech uh, speakers. How can space-based technology be valuable uh, to farmers, agronomists, food manufacturers, and agricultural policymakers who wish to enhance production and profit profitability simultaneously? Whoever chooses to answer the question, please unmute yourself. Perhaps uh, Mr. Masayuki, is he still in the symposium? He is, yes. Or Ms. Cefalo? So the question is uh, technology affect the uh, economy or agriculture or facility or something? How can space tech be valuable to farmers? And food manufacturers and agriculture policymakers who yeah. wish to enhance production and profitability simultaneously. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, as I presented my presentation, but uh, 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 space environment, uh, not using the space environment itself, but uh, the big data from the satellite is important for that. Uh, uh, that culture on ground. Uh, the space can monitor the whole, uh, whole the earth and uh, uh, some environment on ground. So uh, uh, people can uh, analyze the big data and uh, uh, get the answer uh, for a good uh, timing, location, uh, environment on ground for agriculture or some fields. Uh, so, uh, 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 but uh, now uh, recently, uh, some player uh, focused you on big data, but uh, uh, not much people uh, focused you that the big data analysis. Uh, so, uh, I think the increasing the prayer for that uh, data analysis. Uh, for uh, satellite data, uh, uh, I think the, uh, that field uh, can be uh, advanced uh, by using the big data from the satellite. Uh, for example, uh, uh, as I presented, uh, the people can uh, can realize the catch uh, best location to grow the uh, fruit. Uh, by using the data from the satellite, or um, uh, uh, people can get the best timing to harvest uh, uh, plants or something uh, from that data. So it's a useful and variable uh, for that field. 
Thank you so much. I think now we have Mrs. Fatima back on audio. Yes. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Fatima Al Shamsi. I'm the space policy specialist at UAE Space Agency. Um, uh, so um, the presentation will tackle uh, sustainability uh, in the perspective of uh, 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 the policy, uh, mainly uh, uh, how it's aligned with the National Space Strategy uh, 2030, which is a 10 year uh, long plan that will be implemented starting from 2030 until 2030. Um, let me share the screen. Okay. Is it good now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, the topic is on uh, National Space Strategy 2030 and its role in achieving uh, sustainability. Uh, we are talking here about the sustainability of UAE space sector. Um, uh, a little bit of a background. Uh, the UAE Space Agency was established in 2014 and with the establishment of the Space Agency, um, the team worked on developing the National Space Policy in 2016, uh, it gave us the main objectives and aspirations that uh, uh, the UAE government would like to achieve in the space uh, field. And uh, of course, prior to the establishment of the space agency, uh, there were uh, tremendous efforts being conducted by uh, uh, various stakeholders, such as Mohammed Barash Space Center or YASAT uh, in the field of uh, uh, space, but uh, at their own specific uh, working domain. Uh, however, uh, when the space agency was established, uh, its role was to uh, uh, regulate the space sector in a way uh, that will enable uh, all of the stakeholders uh, to work collectively towards uh, uh, the ultimate goal that the government would like to achieve. Now, uh, in 2016, when the national space policy was uh, published, it did give us the house or the tools uh, that will uh, uh, allow us uh, to achieve uh, uh, those aspirations. Uh, this was uh, uh, the outcome uh, that led us to uh, develop the National Space Strategy 2030. Uh, it was uh, uh, approved in 2019. It includes six strategic objectives and 71 initiatives. Uh, those 71 initiatives will be uh, uh, implemented by the UAE Space Agency and the various stakeholders in the uh, UAE space economy. Uh, mainly uh, until the year of 2030. Uh, I'll walk you through uh, fairly quickly on uh, the development of this uh, strategy. Um, uh, uh, so the aim of this strategy is to ensure a sustainable uh, a progress of our uh, space uh, sector. And uh, when we started developing this, the, the strategy, uh, we ensured that we take input from all of the exports within the domain and as well as uh, at an international level. So as you can see, uh, uh, we have an advisory committee at the agency. Uh, their input was uh, taken into consideration at the development phase. Uh, also, we have our uh, uh, key partners such as Mohammed Bin Rashid Space Center, uh, Thuraya, the TRA, and uh, Yasat, for example. Uh, they were... Uh, uh, hand in hand with us uh, at the development, as well as uh, other entities that are uh, not specifically from the space sector, but uh, they play a key role in enabling uh, uh, the achievement of the uh, objectives. Um, uh, now, of course, with the establishment of the agency uh, and uh, the drafting of the strategy itself, uh, we had an exercise. Uh, what are the uh, key space activities that are available and with, which are the ones that we should be focusing on at the uh, coming years. Now, as you can see in the screen, we have identified 23 space activities. And uh, uh, for these 23 space activities, we did an internal assessment. Uh, the assessment included uh, evaluation in terms of uh, uh, the future market size, whether it has an economic return, uh, how does it align with the, our national priorities? And uh, when we when we uh, we completed the exercise, we came up with 13 space activities. Those 13 space activities will drive the, the initiatives uh, of this of this uh, 
uh, strategy for the next 10 years. So they will be the core focus for the agency in the coming years. As you can see, um, uh, one of the main areas uh, that we are focused on is uh, R&D. Uh, this is collectively uh, 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 being focused by the space uh, agency, Mohammed Barash Space Center, um, uh, the academic sector. Uh, they will all enable us achieve uh, uh, the uh, core objectives uh, of this uh, activity or area. Uh, we have uh, other activities such as Earth observation, navigation applications, um, CubeSats, um, uh, exploration uh, missions. Um, um, let me for, uh, let me uh, go forward with the slide, and then I will uh, show you the mapping of how how does it align with the outcome, the final outcome that came uh, after uh, this exercise. Now, uh, of course, when we drafted the strategy, we ensured that it's in alignment with all of the national priorities, as well as the international uh, agendas. Uh, this is one of the examples where it aligns with the uh, Sentinel Plan 2071. The same uh, is, is done with uh, uh, other uh, strategies. For example, here, uh, the UAE aspires after 100 years to, be, to have the best education in the world, the best economy in the world. Um, to be among the happiest societies in the world and the best government in the world. How are we going to achieve that uh, through the national space strategy? Uh, this shows the correlation uh, through the six strategic objectives shown in the screen. Um, uh, now, this is the fruitful outcome of the uh, collective effort that has been put by uh, all of our uh, partners. Um, uh, as you can see, we have six strategic uh, areas or objectives. Uh, the first three strategic objectives, uh, uh, we consider them as an areas of focus, whereas the other uh, three uh, remaining strategic objectives are enablers. They will enable us achieve those, er those areas of focus. Uh, the UAE uh, in the next 10 years will focus on having a competitive and leading space services. Uh, will tap on uh, R&D and manufacturing uh, how to have uh, inspiring space scientific and exploration missions. Um, uh, and of course, this will be enabled by creating space culture and expertise. Now here we are not talking about uh, build, uh, raising awareness. The, the government has invested heavily in uh, uh, building the, uh, the, the awareness and the expertise. And now that we have missions such as the Hope Probe, um, uh, uh, we believe that uh, we do have the uh, appropriate or the needed expertise uh, at the current stage. And we want to build on that uh, uh, further. And uh, of course, given that uh, this is uh, a, sp a space domain, it uh, relies heavily on having a successful uh, partnerships and cooperation at a local and an international uh, uh, stage. And uh, lastly, uh, to have a supportive legislative framework. This is being done by having um, the uh, uh, space law which, which was announced uh, and approved in 2019 um, uh, to have uh, uh, the supporting uh, uh, regulations, uh, to have the uh, strategy in place, uh, to have uh, all of the um, uh, working plans that will enable us have a, a collective uh, work from the academic institutions, from the operators, uh, from the private sector as well hand in hand in achieving those uh, initiatives. So as you can see here, we have six strategic objectives uh, uh, working towards 18 programs and leading to achievement of 71 initiatives. Um, let me uh, walk you through uh, these initiatives fairly quickly. Um, uh, for example, here, if we can see in the screen, uh, one of the uh, uh, initiatives that are uh, uh, of strategic objectives that are related to uh, uh, the, the space technology manufacturing and R&D. Um, uh, example is launching research projects in high national priority fields. So having a sustainable program related to research and development will ensure uh, the continuous development of the space sector. Uh, one initiative is also related to the development of an active mechanism to transfer knowledge and technologies in space satellite manufacturing to the state. So we want to have manufacturing capabilities in the country. This is a, this is considered a priority for us uh, as a UAE. Um, one uh, initiative as well is the development of program 
um, uh, which is mainly uh, focusing on the spin-off. Uh, so how can the space sector uh, technology be transferred to other sectors, as well as how can we obtain other technology from other sectors into the space sector? Um, Moving forward, for example, when it comes to um, launching inspiring space scientific and exploration missions, uh, as you can see here, the Hope Probe is one of the main strategic uh, initiatives that we have here, as well as the Mars 2117 program. I won't walk you through it uh, as uh, uh, my colleague from Mohammed Barash Space Center, I believe he explained it very well. Um, the Arab program for space exploration um, uh, in 2019, uh, Mohammed, uh, His Highness Mohammed bin Rashid uh, uh, announced uh, the establishment of the Arab Space Cooperation Group. So uh, the Arab Space Cooperation Group includes uh, uh, members from various Arab countries. Uh, they will uh, collectively work together uh, to develop expertise and eventually uh, work towards uh, the uh, uh, development of the uh, the 813, which is a hyperspectral satellite. This will be a fruitful outcome of this uh, group and hopefully uh, many other projects to come. Um, uh, now, uh, of course, uh, oh, how are we going to uh, achieve a sustainable space program without uh, retaining uh, uh, the uh, expertise needed uh, locally? Uh, one example is stimulating and retaining space sector personnel while taking gender balance into consideration. Uh, this is a high priority for the UAE, and uh, this is this can be profoundly uh, noticed uh, at, a UAE, uh, at the space agency level. We have a, um, a fairly balanced uh, uh, gen uh, when it comes to uh, gender balance consideration uh, uh, in the employment rate. Um, uh, we have, uh, in terms of uh, the development of expertise. Uh, we have scholarship programs, uh, we have uh, uh, initiatives that are related to uh, raising awareness, summer camps, um, winter camps, um, uh, uh, we, uh, we have uh, training programs. So all of these initiatives, as well as uh, competitions, will enrich the fact that uh, uh, building expertise is a high priority for the government. Uh, when it comes to effective local and international partnerships, uh, one example of uh, where we can uh, tap on sustainability is for uh, the join, uh, joining of international alliances for the exchange of space data and expertise related to the protection of environment and management of disasters and crisis. Uh, as you know, the UAE is a signatory and a member of the disaster charter. This is one example, uh, and uh, um, um, our presence uh, in the international uh, uh, platform we all we uh, assure uh, uh, our uh, um, uh, support to sustainability and its initiatives um, last but not least is ensuring a supportive legislative framework and infrastructure to match the future uh, development in the sector uh, my example here is the initiative of the development of a regulatory framework for the space sector uh, to, and uh, to monitor the compliance um, this is, um, let me be specific. Now here we are not talking about just monitoring the compliance. We wanna make uh, the UAE as attractive, uh, to have an attractive environment as much as possible. Uh, this will not uh, only support uh, the uh, national uh, uh, pro space program uh, in itself, but also uh, will make it uh, uh, an attractive environment for the private sector uh, uh, to, uh, facilitate their activities in the country, as well as for other international uh, 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 agencies to consider uh, or entities, uh, whether it's private or, uh, uh, or, or from any other domain uh, to open uh, uh, new branches in the UAE. Uh, this is uh, an example, uh, as you see uh, in the picture uh, on the left, uh, this is the event that we had in 2019. Uh, uh, we have we held uh, several uh, workshops related to space law. Uh, we had uh, the launch uh, uh, re recently. Uh, I would say um, two weeks back, uh, we had a webinar on the space law. Uh, so we we uh, we are putting some effort uh, towards raising awareness uh, in regards to that. Um, uh, in the screen on the right here, as you can see, we have an initiative. Uh, which is the new space program. It's an uh, incubator uh, uh, 
uh, where we uh, work collectively with Crypto Labs, uh, one of our uh, uh, partners, uh, into uh, supporting startups in the space domain and uh, providing them with the, with all of the support, whether it's financial or uh, uh, in terms of uh, advi uh, advice, uh, advice, advisement. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, how uh, we are trying to build up on the partnerships and the uh, supportive legislative framework. Now, uh, of course, uh, we have 71 initiatives and they will be implemented within the next 10 years. How are we going to ensure that uh, we do implement them, but not just um, uh, tick, uh, ticking the box. We want to make sure that uh, when we are working uh, in the implementation phase, that all of the initiatives ha do have an impact and uh, the impact to have a long uh, term uh, that spans over uh, the year of 2030. Uh, of course, uh, this relies on the space agency to have an effective uh, stewardship over that, uh, uh, meaning uh, for us to have uh, uh, um, uh, meetings or uh, let me say uh, um, uh, awareness of the, the strategy. Uh, like, uh, for example, I would mention that uh, um, most recently, we are meeting with all of the entities, not just uh, having, um, for example, a one workshop where we present uh, the strategy, uh, what are its objectives. No, we, uh, our aim here is to have uh, some sort of a, um, a very tight relationship with all of our stakeholders. So the, uh, the uh, task here on us here is to have a one-to-one -one meeting with each and every initiative. The, yes, this takes uh, 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 much more time than if we have uh, uh, one uh, awareness workshop, but uh, we want to give a dedicated time for each entity to ask all of the questions that they need, to give them all of the support uh, uh, that they would require from us. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this is not enough. Uh, we do have uh, the National uh, Supervision uh, Committee of the National Space Strategy. So this is a committee that was established in the uh, first quarter of 2020. It includes members from uh, various uh, uh, stakeholders, such as uh, the operators. Uh, we have members from Mohammed Bin Rashid Space Center, um, NSSTC, uh, also from academia, uh, and also from other uh, entities uh, that are um, uh, from other than the space uh, uh, domain. Uh, they, uh, the, the aim of this uh, supervision committee is to have them as a think tanks. Uh, we want to uh, rely on their expertise in uh, 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 overseeing, for example, uh, if they see an opportunity for us that, uh, uh, that is beneficial for us to seize, we will tackle into that. Uh, if, for example, there are gaps, we want to discuss it with them. Uh, how can we mitigate them? And uh, yes, this is the main role of the supervision committee. Uh, and of course, there, there will be a continuous assessment uh, to identify the caps and opportunities in the strategy itself. So for example, if we see a new technology uh, or an initiative that, uh, uh, that is uh, important for the UAE to implement, we will, we will surely include it in the strategy. We will not wait until uh, the end of uh, uh, the duration of the plan. Uh, we have the uh, initiatives implementation charter. This is just for the uh, implementation sake. We do support it uh, with, uh, with the implementing uh, stakeholders. And uh, last but not least, uh, here, as you can see, uh, and as I mentioned before, um, um, to, to be able to successfully implement the strategy, it relies heavily on uh, the support of the uh, various uh, stakeholders. And uh, this map shows you the uh, the uh, scope of uh, who are uh, the players that uh, we are the like uh, uh, the domains or the uh, uh, um, I would say uh, entity types uh, that uh, we are approaching. Uh, it's not explicit to these entities. This is just an illustrative example um, uh, for uh, uh, the knowledge sake. Uh, we do uh, uh, ensure that. Uh, or let me say it in another way. Uh, for the past, uh, let me say two months, uh, we we have we have been holding uh, uh, these uh, daily uh, meetings with all of our stakeholders. 
from different ones. And uh, I can assure you that uh, the enthusiasm and the uh, support is uh, really huge. And we are uh, really happy to, uh, uh, to have the momentum from uh, um, everyone. And uh, we will, inshallah, uh, tap into that and uh, ensure a continuation of such uh, uh, supportive uh, uh, spirit uh, in the uh, development of the strategy. Uh, thank you. I hope that uh, it was um, a delightful presentation at the end of the uh, um, uh, 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 symposium. Uh, now, uh, back to you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for your, this uh, inspiring presentation. Now, we still have 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, there is one question regarding satellite imagery data. How can satellite imagery data serve to identify and help underground water resources in drought prone regions? Anyone who would like to answer this question, please unmute yourself. Yep, I, I can take this one. Uh, yeah, we, we can bolt out some, some information. So um, as I was saying before, it is extremely, um, it, one of the main uh, mission actually of uh, satellite data and uh, remote sensing system, it is water uh, and management identification. So uh, there are on the, the telecommunication spacecraft, there are different payloads with different cameras and each of them is is tapping into different microwaves so that you can get the information out of them. So one of the ways is really to access the kind of satellite that has that payload for Earth observation that is giving the remote sensing service for that particular mission. Um, and as we were talking, saying before, as Masayuki also said, there are open source uh, database of satellite data that can already be used. There are plenty of imagery already taken of all different areas on the world. And what it is interesting is that we can um, even, let's say, all, all our efforts. And uh, as Betlana also said, it is the outreach to the community. So the information is there, the technology is there, the mission has started, has started already. And most important thing is that we have scientists, people that are able to read them. And this goes back to the institutions. So as much as you need them, where do you need them? The institutions can need to be enabled to have this kind of know-how in their house on site so that they can just access the open source and have people reading the information. Thank you, Bianca, for this answer. Given that the space sector is a diverse sector with multiple specificities, what are its potential advancements in other domains? And what does this mean for global governments? I mean, uh, space is uh, uh, one sector, I mean, uh, but in all over the world, it's uh, well embedded now in all economical uh, and the social uh, aspects of life in every country. Uh, so you go from uh, providing jobs to uh, scientists and engineers, uh, providing platform from them for them to come up with innovative solutions, innovative solutions to end up by providing services to uh, people on the, on, the, on the ground, on earth, and then eventually uh, life gets improved. So uh, big companies, I mean, space uh, for the past few years have been shifting towards uh, becoming a uh, commercial uh, uh, side of it is becoming uh, increasingly growing. So uh, I think uh, like any other sector, uh, aviation or uh, mining or Agriculture space is uh, is really embedded in all uh, economical life of uh, humans on Earth. Uh, plus, it's it's one of the enablers, similar to any other uh, sector. It is one of the enablers for advancement and uh, uh, improvement of life, like uh, any other sector. So, I don't think we can live without space. I don't think we can live without any uh, diverse solutions that space provides. A lot of people maybe question the need for exploration. 
it's a, it's always a question why we need to go to to to, to moon or mars what okay. is okay <laughs> yeah. maybe but, uh, uh, yeah. not, can, yes uh, i would like to say that uh, uh, in this point uh, space can give even more than some of the other sectors because science that uh, you can perform with uh, exploration uh, can really uh, be used by everybody it can be used for new knowledge but also to train uh, the new brains and to give challenge to the to the youth to learn more that's very important but also it creates some technical challenge you know for instance we want to miniaturize things uh, we want to uh, learn how to live in extreme environment so these are also technical challenge that all over the world, uh, some uh, brilliant mind and good hands, they can uh, try to solve. And another challenge, it teaches us to work together all over the world. And this is also very important, how we build peace, how we work as a team to do science or to make business, or also just to have uh, some peaceful venture. So in this area, that's something where science and exploration can really, uh, really help all over the world. That's why we think that science uh, technologies are really part of this uh, big moon village where everybody would be involved. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, not something, you know, the diversity is not only coming from the peace and, poli and politics, but it's also diversity of new skills. Because there is this myth about just being an engineer or just being a scientist or actually not. You can be a psychologist, you can be a, a, a yeah. doctor, you can be a fashion designer because we will need to design clothing for people on other habits. Yeah. You can be an artist, you can be yeah. anything that you can possibly think of. And that's di that diversity is enabling even the evolution of not only our minds, but then our tech outside the earth. Thank you. Certainly, yeah. About the use of space in military purposes. How can we deal with this competition and how countries can work together to avoid this kind of competition? What is the impact on the future of the space industry? So I have a little, some answer on this. From the legal part, for instance, uh, the Outer Space Treaty prevent to have military activities on the moon. So this is covered. But the military activities are crucial to establish you know, our safety. And uh, part of the military activities have been also instrumental to develop new technology. So some of this budget from the military, we want to use for exploration, for learning to work together, you know, a peaceful enterprise like the International Space Station, which was also built a bit with some military uh, investment, this has some peaceful purpose. So there is part of the goal of being safer that can be addressed by using some of the military budget to the sake of doing uh, science to, together, uh, by uh, getting teams all over the world to, to work together, by also educating uh, uh, youngsters all over the world that we have to serve a peaceful world. Thank you, Bena. Should we behave ethically in space? Or should intellectual, <laughs> or should intellectual <laughs> scientific and profit-driven <laughs> factors override ethical obligation to protect space and other planets? Uh, uh, I would like to add to the previous question, uh, is that um, historically, uh, our progress in space was based on the military uh, purposes. So nobody was uh, aimed at discovering space, giving internet to everybody <laughs> and to find lives on other planets. Um, but from this point of view, uh, military purposes bring, uh, brought us to civil um, usage of space. Mm -hmm. So currently in, uh, uh, in our modern times, I think all countries and international cooperation must be aimed for cooperation. <laughs> Sorry mm. to, to say it again. Yes, uh, and for civil exploration and to bring uh, knowledge for expanding human lives to other planets and to live in, in peace <laughs> on Earth and uh, other planets. Yeah, Thank space force for peace and science and for benefit for everybody. Thank you. Go uh, I, I, I think that I know the, the historical uh, development for space related to uh, military, I know. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, nowadays the businessmen uh, focus uh, notice to uh, space development. Uh, it is very good 
a situation for advancing the space field uh, because uh, uh, they uh, want to use the space environment or data from the satellite for uh, economic or um, improvement uh, life on the Earth. So it, it is uh, used for peace uh, without uh, military. It's a, uh, uh, one, uh, the other option to use the uh, space field, I think. Thank you. In March 2019, the UAE Space Agency signed an MOU with Abu Dhabi Airports company to explore the use of AI and in international airport as a potential spaceport. Will flights be launched from this space platform? Um, this is something still under discussion. So um, let's wait and see until uh, something is announced officially. Sure. Can you give examples of national strategies in developing or developed countries that streamline space policy with uh, sustainable development policy? Um, so you mean um, other uh, space policies that are aligned with the uh, sustainable development? Yes. So um, let me phrase it in another way. Um, uh, the UAE Space Agency and as well as uh, other uh, space uh, stakeholders in the government are uh, participating heavily in the uh, drafting phase of the uh, Space 2030. This is uh, a draft, a provisional draft that is currently being uh, uh, developed at the United Nations uh, Office of Outer Space. Um, it mainly tackles how uh, 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 the space aligns with sustainability. Uh, also, in the government, uh, we have uh, a national-wide uh, um, uh, committee that uh, that oversees uh, the develop, develop, uh, the achievement of the government uh, and its uh, activities when it comes to the uh, sustainable development goals. And of course, uh, the space sector uh, uh, is uh, part of the uh, uh, enabling. Uh, let me say um, um, uh, partners in the achievement of those goals. Um, uh, yes, and the LTS as well, the long-term sustainability guidelines, we did align them uh, at the uh, drafting phase of the strategy. Thank you, Fatima. Um, Dr. Martinez wanted to speak. Thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. So I, um, I just wanted to go back to this earlier question about the military uses of space. And, and certainly, uh, I agree with all the other speakers uh, on the panel that the military has always had a very, very strong uh, role to play in the development of space technologies, uh, going back to the earliest days of the space age. And many of the systems that uh, we rely on, like GNSS, have been developed for military purposes. But um, if we go back to one of the slides I showed in my presentation, where we see that the commercial sector is now a very significant user of space, we are seeing many new kinds of space activities and um, a growing um, uh, congestion and, and contestation of these uh, limited natural resources of the space environment, which we can all use for peaceful purposes and for the benefit of all nations. And so therefore, it's very important that we have clear uh, rules of the road for military and civilian users of space so that we avoid uh, situations that could lead to potential conflict because um, the, the last thing we want to see is uh, conflict in outer space that uh, creates uh, debris and, uh, and, and makes the environment unusable for, for all other space actors. And so this is one area where I think uh, all users of space, both military and civilian, have common cause to discuss the development of norms of responsible behavior so that we all know and understand what responsible behavior is and looks like, and more importantly, what it does not look like. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Um, here's the last questions before the closing remarks. How can space missions be streamlined with SDGs to monitor natural resources and reduce poverty? Yeah, there are already efforts that are undertaken by 
space agencies, but also by uh, uh, remote observing company, you know, like Planet and others, to make available some of the data where uh, you can uh, monitor what is changing on Earth. I think that it's also very important that uh, we uh, uh, help the users. We were talking about agriculture, but the citizen to uh, have access to this uh, data. And uh, also we create an expertise in developing countries to uh, analyze this data and to create it also some added service that can help to create uh, jobs all over the world because uh, clearly um, brilliant minds and uh, you know, courageous youngsters, you can find them all over the world. So if you give them some a bit of uh, seed training, some opportunities, they could really contribute also to the added value of all the earth observing uh, system. Thank you, Professor. Well, I know we're 10 minutes over time, ladies and gentlemen. So I think we've presented, you all have presented tremendous value through this two and a half hour long symposium. So this symposium whose main theme was the role of space in sustainable development. Uh, we hope uh, the participants understand the need of space for sustainable development and the need of exponential collaboration and cooperation. We also uh, share the need for uh, inspiring the future generation, the challenges and uh, solutions to sustainability in our space. Um, I would like to pay my deep respect and gratitude to the organizers, Trans Research and Advisorville, to all participants for your positive participation in the symposium and the, and the good questions. Uh, I hope that what you have learned through the symposium will help you a lot in your future missions and will lead to a sustainable future of space for all and inspire the future generation. Now, the final remarks will be delivered by Mr. Ahmed al Asta, the scientific advisor for research and advisory. Thank you, uh, Hen. Uh, distinguished speakers, distinguished viewers, ladies and gentlemen, the symposium tonight gave us uh, a unique opportunity to learn about two very important subjects, space and sustainable development. They are both critical for the survival of humankind, for the future of science, and for expanding the boundaries of human knowledge. I take this opportunity on behalf of Dr. Mohammed Al Ali, Director General of Trans Research and Advisory Centers, and Trans Team to thank the United Nations and other agencies for their important role in advancing space technology and sustainable development. We thank all speakers and experts for taking the time to share their views in the symposium. I thank the moderator for conducting the session smoothly and all the audience and participants. You are all invited to join us for our next symposium, Economic Stimulus Programs, Requirements and Challenges, which will be held on Tuesday, July 14th. And you can get more information from visiting our website, uh, trendsresearch.org. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.